Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. Now, just a little recap. Uh, today we're going to discuss the function of blood uh, in transport. One hundred and twenty-one onwards. Okay. We are almost at the end of the chapter. So we have to discuss two things today. One is the role of blood uh, for transport of various substances. And second is lymphatic uh, circulation and lymphatic uh, vessels. Now this transport uh, of substances in blood, I briefly discussed already with you while I was discussing this table on page 118. This, this table is a summary of what we are going to discuss right now. So every all the points are in a condensed form within this table. Table 9.2 on page 118. Right, now uh, just a little recap of what blood is made up of. We discussed 40, almost 41 to 44% is red blood cells and then the 55% is plasma. Plasma uh, mostly is water with all these substances dissolving in water. And yesterday, I tried my best to explain you guys the polar molecule thing. And the reason why I was emphasizing so much on um, the polar molecules is because, you know, it explains why certain substances dissolve in water. They are polar. So they dissolve in water and therefore they are found in the plasma and they are uh, transported by the plasma part of water. And also because of so many other reasons, this polarity of molecules is such a helpful concept, not only in biology, in chemistry, okay, as well, and a little of physics as well. Okay, so the other part, so this is red blood cell, this is plasma. These are the substances which dissolve in plasma and therefore are transported by plasma. And the rest of the 4% is WBCs and platelets. Okay, quick, quick review. Uh, did we do these questions on page 119? Maybe, yeah, we did. Uh, at the end of the last class, I think we did discuss these questions. Okay, so I hope you guys remember the function of platelets, the function of WBCs, the function of hemoglobin, the function of red blood cells. No, we did not discuss. Okay, then let's do it real quick. This will, this will be like a recap as well. Okay, answer this question. Uh, okay, then list five substances. Okay, leave this question. We will do, do, do this later. What is the function of red blood cells? What is the function of red blood cells? Easy, easy. Come on, to carry oxygen. Yes, good job, Ajwa, to transport oxygen. Good job. What is unusual about the structure of red blood cells? Yes, Lubna, yes, uh, to supply oxygen. Okay, what is unusual about, yes, Samia, no nucleus. Yes, yes, Aisha Nadim, yes. Absence of nucleus is what is special, unusual. You know, the word unusual meaning that you will not find in other cells, in other ordinary cells. What is, what is uh, peculiar about the structure of red blood cell that you won't find in other cells and that is the absence of nucleus. Okay, what is hemoglobin? Yes, it is a transport protein that uh, transports oxygen from one region or one cell to the other, right? It's a transport protein found within the red blood cells. Okay, what are platelets? Good job. And what is their function? Yes, they are fragments of cells and they form the clot. Okay, not scab, hala, clot. Okay, use the word clot. I'm not sure if scab and clot is, are the same thing. I'll have to confirm. But uh, yeah, I think clot is a more scientific term. Okay. So, okay, this is recap. Now, uh, so we know WBCs are for, okay, what was the function of w blood, uh, white blood cells? What was the function of white blood cells? And what were the two types of white blood cells we discussed in the last class? Good job, defense. Yes, okay, yes, killing bacteria and fighting against the pathogens. Okay, so what were the two types? What was the difference between them? One was? Yes, Hala, one was phagocytes, other was lymphocytes. Good job. And how do they differ? 
in their fight against the virus, uh, against the pathogens? How were they different in their fight against, the, like both of them are, right, lymphocytes, now, Yusra, you're telling me difference in the structure. Yes, Ajwa, yes, Samya. Lymphocytes produce antibodies, whereas phagocytes, they engulf, like they hug, they take in this picture. Can you see? They are hugging their arms out to hug the pathogen. They take them in within a vacuole. Within the vacuole, they release enzymes. They dissolve this pathogen and then the soluble substances after the di digestion are then used by the phagocyte itself, right? And the reason why they make a vacuole is so that the pathogen does not harm or affect the phagocyte itself, right? Okay, now after we have recapped all of this, now we should appreciate the fact that uh, the transport part of the whole blood are only two, red blood cell and plasma. They are blood clot defense, right? So we're not gonna talk about them today. We're gonna talk about red blood cells and plasma. Red blood cell is easy. We discussed quite a bit in the last class that red blood cells, their shape, their biconcave disc shape gives them a high surface area. And remember, we also discussed that most of the movements of substances is diffusion, right? Most of the movement of substances is diffusion. And the three factors which increase the rate of diffusion are surface area, distance, and concentration gradient, right? Now, the shape, now how do we get uh, increased surface area? Because increased surface area will increase the rate of diffusion. Increased surface area we get by the biconcave disc of the red blood cells. And secondly, by the extensive branching network of capillaries. These two structural features increase the surface area and therefore increase the rate of diffusion. Also, the extensive branching of capillaries ensures that every last cell of the body is fed by the blood, right? Uh, okay. Decreased distance. Again, extensive branching network of capillaries makes sure that the distance between the red blood cell and the cell that it is providing is as minimum as possible. Okay, the extensive branching reaches each and every last cell of the body. Now, concentration gradient, we'll discuss this. Do you understand concentration gradient? Do you understand concentration gradient um, in diffusion? Regions which have higher, concentra uh, higher concentration of oxygen, their oxygen will preferably come and combine with the hemoglobin. Remember, I showed you the structure of he hemoglobin with the four yellow disks and they were heme, I told you, and oxygen will come and sit on them, right? And in those regions where the oxygen concentration is high and the tissue which has the highest oxygen concentration is, the tissue with the highest con uh, oxygen concentration is? Yes, good job, lungs, good job, lungs, of course, because lung is the tissue where the oxygen is entering into the body. So yeah, and the lowest oxygen concentration is, you know, exercising muscles or, you know, cardiac tissue, tissues that are, or tissues that are uh, using up, uh, oxygen they're and you know they're they're respiring and therefore they're producing carbon dioxide so tissues that have low oxygen concentration will have higher carbon dioxide concentration so regions where there is higher ox oxygen concentration oxygen will sit on this hemoglobin will hop onto this hemoglobin and in regions where oxygen concentration is low this oxygen molecule will hop off will hop off and will go into the tissues. You want me to, uh, you understand this, right? I don't need to make a diagram to explain this. Yeah, yeah, lungs are organ. Yes, lungs are organ. Okay, so where the concentration of oxygen is low, there uh, carbon dioxide concentration will be high and therefore carbon dioxide will go and sit on the hemoglobin, right? And so it is the concentration gradient, okay? 
So the transport of that substance, which is higher in concentration. Okay, this we discussed. Uh, okay. Now let's move on to plasma. Okay, let's move on to plasma. Now plasma, I told you those substances which can dissolve in plasma, right? Now you will say carbon dioxide is non-polar, then how come it is transported by plasma? That's because it is highly reactive with water. It reacts with water to give carbonic acid, which then dissociates into uh, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So basically carbon dioxide is transported in this ionic form by carbonate. And because of this charge, it's easier for the water molecules to dissolve it and transport it. A small amount is transported by hemoglobin within the red blood cell. You know, just, just like I just mentioned, that in the regions where carbon dioxide concentration is high, carbon dioxide will come and attach to hemoglobin, right? So small amount is transported by the red blood cells, hemoglobin, and large amount will be transported in the form of bicarbonate ions in the plasma. Right. Now, this is easy that, you know, uh, the, carbon, the blood, which is rich in carbon dioxide, is deoxygenated blood, and it is in the veins, okay? Veins eventually drain into the heart, right? And then the heart drain, uh, pumps it to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries, where it then uh, refreshes its supplies of oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is then expired out through, uh, the ex uh, through the exhaled air, right? And then we have digestive food substances. Let's move on to the digestive food substances. Now, these are the major food molecules we take in to our, in our food protein is that they're digested into amino acids, carbohydrates into glucose, lipids into fatty acids, and glycerol. Now, these are large, very large molecules and therefore they are insoluble. So they, these molecules being large makes them insoluble and therefore difficult for the blood to transport them. Secondly, their large size will be inconvenient for the cells to absorb. The cells will not be able to absorb such large molecules. Therefore, they have to be digested into these smaller and polar and therefore soluble in the plasma. Amino acids, they are smaller compared to proteins. Proteins are like these big chains. Amino acids are like, you know, these are small pieces and also they are polar, okay? Yesterday I was trying to explain you that. Glucose, again, I told you it's a hydrocarbon, but because it has oxygen in it, that makes this glucose also polar. Lipids is, con is also broken down into fatty acids, polar, glycerol, polar, okay? Lipid itself is hydrocarbon, predominantly hydrocarbon. So it is insoluble, highly insoluble. It's like oil, you know. Now, these smaller soluble particles, small molecules, are absorbed through the blood capillaries of the intestines and then from the intestines, they are taken to, where are they taken? Remember, I told you that after absorption, I mean, after we eat and then, you know, our digestive system digests all the food substances and then the uh, sol soluble substances are absorbed into the capillaries, but these substances cannot directly enter into our blood circulation because if they are directly, if they directly enter into our blood circulation, the levels of these substances will all of a sudden rise and spike in our blood, which is harmful for the cells. Okay, the blood has to maintain these levels at a constant normal range within the normal range. Okay, which will provide a constant environment to the cells, which is very essential for the best working of the cells. Remember, Cells work best when the environment they are in is constant within the normal range, neither too high nor too low. What do I mean by environment of the cells? Environment of the cells includes the temperature of the cells, includes the concentration 
of substances around the cells, concentration of all these substances, glucose, amino acids, all of that, and then concentration of oxygen, and then concentration of carbon dioxide, and pH of blood, and all of this together makes the environment of cells. And all these factors should stay constant within the normal range for the optimal and best working of these cells. Now, let me share my screen with you. Wait, let me share my screen with you. I wanna, okay. Here, okay, this picture. Now, this is a small intestine, villus, you know, the, those villi, remember the small intestine? structure have you guys done the digestive system right you you have done the digestive system so if you remember from there you have microvilli in the small intestine where most of the absorption of food substances takes place right now this is one of those projections singular projection is called a villus b i w -L, l u s okay and underneath the villus or within you know on the inside of the villus you will see these capillaries and this green colored lacteal, this, this is called a lacteal, okay? So here, uh, all the digested food substances are absorbed into the blood capillaries, except for the fats, except for fat, because fat is insoluble and fat, uh, fat, uh, fatty molecules are large and they are insol insoluble. So they are enclosed within special structures, okay? And, though, and then that those fat molecules are absorbed into these lacteals instead, okay? Because these, this, this, these fat molecules are insoluble and they are big and they're large in size. So they are absorbed into these lacteals. And then can you see both the blood and the lacteals are taking these substances where? not into the general circulation, but into the liver first. I told you, liver is that, you know, immigration. Before you enter into the general circulation, before you enter into the blood of this body, I have to check you first. Do you have any harmful substances? Did you bring in any harmful substances? Or how much of glucose have you brought in? Okay, not too much. I mean, not not all the glucose mo mo molecules will be allowed to enter into the blood because that will lead to spike in the level of blood glucose and that is harmful for the cell. So we don't want that. So the liver will allow only as much glucose into the blood as is required to bring the blood glucose level back to normal. Okay, any excess, any excess of blood, uh, any excess of glucose brought in will be either stored within the liver as glycogen or it will be stored and converted into fats and can be stored within the liver or even in the, in the adipose tissue. Okay, and if there are any harmful substances, you know, like when we eat junk food, a lot of preservatives, chemicals and colors, those will be either detoxified if the liver can or, uh, yeah, yeah, or, you know, if, if you are bombarding this liver with so many harmful substances, which is beyond the capacity of this liver, then of course, you know, liver also has its limitation and then those toxic materials will enter into your circulation and they are harmful, right? And so that's the function of the liver. So the, the substances have to enter the liver before they can enter into the general circulation. Therefore, the blood taking the blood coming from the intestines will go into the liver via the hepatic portal vein portal look at this spelling p o r t a l portal what does this what does this uh, term mean i told you yeah p o r t a l what does this mean why are we calling it a portal vein let me see who remembers I mentioned in the last class. Yes, good job, Ajwa. It connects one organ to another, right? It connects the two organs and does not drain directly into the heart, 
and does not branch directly from the aorta, right? Okay, Hala, that's a good question. What's a lacteal? Lacteal, um, I did not start teaching lymphatic as yet, but lacteals are lymphatic capillaries of the intestines. They're just lymphatic capillaries of the intestines. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about them in detail just in the last part of this chapter. Right. Uh, okay. Okay. Please zoom in the area of explanation. Okay. Deoxygenated. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, so hepatic portal vein. Where was I? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so from uh, the intestines, okay, blood capillaries as well as the lacteals into lacteals are lymphatic capillaries of the small intestine, taking all the absorbed substances to the liver via the hepatic portal vein into the liver, and then from the liver uh, through the he hepatic vein to inferior vena cava, and then the substances are allowed to enter into the general circulation. So that's what happens to digested food substances. By the way, all of this is condensed in a summarized form in table 9.2, okay, on page 118. Now, urea. Urea is one of the excretory waste product uh, when the body is breaking down the amino acids, especially the liver. This, this happens in the, in the liver. You know, when the amino acids are brought in, uh, from the small intestine into the liver, the liver decides now what to do with these amino acids. Does the body need to build proteins? If the person is a child and he's growing and they need to synthesize new proteins, good job, Ajwa. Yeah, uh, you know, when, uh, if, if the body needs new pro proteins, the liver will use these amino acids to make those new pro proteins. Otherwise, if the person does not need it, then these amino acids are converted into other amino acids which might be needed or or if you know the person does not need it it depends upon what the person needs these can even be converted excess of amino acids can even be converted back into fats okay but uh, that is rare okay now urea is the waste product can you see this is the general structure molecular structure of amino acids right? Can you see this NH2 coming in here? And then another amino acid maybe will be pro providing the, the other NH2. And this C double bond O, this carbon double bond oxygen came from this part of the amino acids. So it is the processing of amino acids, which results in the formation of this urea. And you can now very well imagine that this is also a polar molecule because of this oxygen, which is so highly electronegative. Okay, electronegative meaning attraction for the electron. So because it is polar, it dissolves in the blood plasma and is excreted through the kidneys in the urine. Now urine is predominantly water. You cannot have molecules which are not soluble in water be excreted through the urine. So most of the substances which are being excreted through the urine are water soluble. They are all polar. Okay, this is one of them, urea. From urea, urine. Okay, from urea came the word urine because urea is the main uh, constituent of urine. What? what, what what's the question? Okay, I'll, I'll take the questions later. Okay, first let me finish with this. Then hormones. Now, uh, I told you the definition of hormones before, but let me repeat. They are chemical substances which are, which are produced in the bodies, in the body to regulate and control the activity of, of certain cells and organs. Like there are chemical substances which are released by different organs and these organs can be called endocrine glands. And they are produced to regulate and control the activity of various other organs, you know, a set of other, I mean, 
a set of organs, right? Those organs can be called as target organs. You know, some organs, I'm just making a schematic for you to understand a schematic diagram. For example, these are endocrine glands. They will be producing hormones. Okay, these hormones will be released into blood and then they will go and regulate the activity and control the activities of these other organs which are called target organs and somebody in last class asked me a very good question then how do the hormones know that these are my target organs that i, I gotta work on them only yeah that that is decided by the receptors there are some receptors on their surfaces when the molecule comes into contact with these receptors they know these are my target organs so with the help of these with the help of these structures, the hormones recognize their target organs. So these are hormones, okay? Now, if the hormones are protein in nature, protein I told you is soluble, polar again, therefore they are easily transported by the plasma of the blood. But if they are non-polar, which we do have, steroid hormones, then they are bounded by, they, are, they bind with the protein, they bind with the, water soluble protein to be carried along the blood plasma right so they have to bind to plasma proteins to be able to be transported by the plasma okay that's all and then we have plasma proteins proteins which are found in the plasma such as fibrinogen okay who will tell me the function of fibrinogen who remembers from last class function of fibrinogen does anybody remember the function of fibrinogen. Uh, what is the difference between? Yes, Ajwa, good job. I am happy with you. Yes. Uh, fibrinogen uh, is a soluble protein which would be converted into fibrin that is insoluble. Remember, in blood clot formation, we did here in blood clot formation, yes this platelets and damaged tissues were releasing uh, clotting factors and those clotting factors they activate the enzymes which convert fibrinogen into fibrin fibrinogen were soluble proteins found in plasma into insoluble fibrin which are like thin like string like structures and they form a meshwork helping to trap the red blood cells through the cut you know yeah along with the platelets if you remember Yes. So yes, that fibrinogen. So fibrinogen, this fibrinogen is soluble, but then it is converted into insoluble fibrin, okay, uh, in, in blood clot formation. Okay. So that was all about the transport of substances. Okay. Now, can you attend this question? List five substances that are transported in plasma. Five substances that are transported in plasma. Platelets are not transported. Yeah, hormones, Yusra, good job. Water, okay, water. Fibrinogen, yes, yes. Oxygen, good job. Uh, yes, Aisha, urea, yes. Carbon dioxide, yes. Yes, plasma proteins, yes. Amino acids, good job, yes. Glucose, antibodies, yes. Uh, yes, antibodies also, yes, nutrients. Good job, yes. Okay, so I, I can feel that you guys understood what I wanted you to understand, good. Okay, did I do these questions? No, I don't, I, I don't think I did. Okay, let's attempt these questions. Why is blood in arteries a brighter red than the blood in veins? Do every organs get hormones? Yeah, almost every. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Okay. Yes, dissolved gases. Okay, let's try these questions now. Why is blood in arteries a brighter red than the blood in veins? Yes, Ibrahim, because the arteries have oxy blood. Oxy blood? Oxyhemoglobin. Yes, Aisha Nazim. Yes, it's oxyhemoglobin. Yes. Remember, I told you that iron 2 plus into iron 3 plus. Yes, it has to do with that as well. 
Yes, it's oxyhemoglobin is brighter red in color. Yes. Okay. Uh, which vessel transports digested food to the liver? Good job. Everybody knows I'm so happy. Yes, hepatic portal vein. Yes. How is urea transported? How is urea transported? Good job. Uh, yes, in the plasma and it is excreted through the kidneys in the urine. Yes, and it dissolves in plasma. Right. Okay. 9.35. Outline two functions of blood other than transport. Other, yes. Good job. Blood clotting and... No, other than transport. So not carrying oxygen and fighting against pathogens. Yes. Remember I told you that those components of blood, uh, only we, we have discussed all the components except for the white blood cells and the platelets. These were the only two things we skipped and we have talked about these. Right? So yeah, white blood cells for defense against pathogens and platelets, blood clots. So these are the other two functions other than transport. These, this is all transport. Okay? This is all transport. This is blood clot and uh, defense against pathogens. Okay. Now let's move on to the tissue fluid. Okay. Now look at this drawing of mine. A fibrinogen is a soluble protein. Uh, a fibrinogen is a soluble protein in the, in the plasma and it is converted into its insoluble fibrin in case of some cut or damage to the tissues. Okay, because of the uh, clotting factors. Clotting factors activate enzymes and those enzymes convert the soluble fibrinogen into fibrin. Why do we need hormones? We need hormones for the regulation and control of activities of different organs. Okay? Okay. Now, this is, you know, the basic outlay of uh, the circulatory system, real rough. Okay, this is heart. Okay, aorta, main artery. Okay? And this is the capillary bed, okay? And this is vein draining the uh, deoxygenated back into the heart. Now, here is where we are having the exchange of substances, right? Now, you know the heart is pumping blood into the arteries. And so the blood here in the arteries originating from the heart has a higher blood pressure, okay? The pressure here in arteries is higher. So we can we can say this is a sort of arteriole, right? And so the blood entering through the arteriole has a higher pressure, entering into the capillary with a little pressure. So pressure here will be greater than pressure here. I can call this PA for artery and B for vein. So pressure at the arteriolar end will be greater than the pressure at this end, right? Now, when the blood enters with pressure, the liquid part of the blood, what is that liquid part of the blood? Plasma, right? The liquid part of the blood, which is, yes, plasma, oozes out or comes out. Okay, why? Because if you remember, if you remember uh, this diagram, which is here, this diagram, this, I want you to pay attention to this diagram on page 122. You can see gaps between the cells of the capillaries, right? You can see the gaps in between the cells which are making the capillary walls, right? So this is like acting as a sieve. So when the blood is entering, when the blood is entering with pressure, the liquid part or the plasma part, for example, oozes out or comes out through these holes, okay? For example, this, the blood is coming with pressure, okay? Some of the blood gets out due to pressure, okay? Not blood, plasma, only the liquid part. These red blood cells are too big 
and their shape does not change. They do not change their biconcave shape. Therefore, they cannot manage to squeeze through these gaps. Only the liquid, the water part of the blood, which is plasma, along with its dissolved molecules, along with the dissolved gases and the molecules that they are carrying with it, that the plasma is carrying with it, will be able to get out of the capillaries into the surrounding tissues. Can I have a black? Black. Okay. Now these are surrounding tissues, okay? These surrounding tissues are the cells or the surrounding cells which require oxygen and which need to give off their uh, excretory products like carbon dioxide and urea and they also require oxygen and uh, glucose and all the nutrients that the blood has brought with it. So plasma has all these things dissolved in it, right? We just discussed it. So the liquid part oozes out and therefore those molecules can easily diffuse into these cells. And in return, the cells can diffuse the excretory products back like carbon dioxide and uh, urea. The, the red blood cells, they are too big and their size does not change. So they will not squeeze through these uh, capillaries. They will stay within the capillary, but oxygen can diffuse out. Oxygen is a small molecule and it can easily diffuse out. By the way, I got a little wrong with this diagram. The oxygen molecule is so small that it does not require these gaps for its movement. It can easily pass through the cells. It can easily pass through the cell. By the way, these cells are also very flat and thin. So oxygen molecule can easily pass through these cells, can easily diffuse. And all this movement, predominantly all these movements are diffusion. Okay, you can see the urea coming out of the cells. And white blood cells have irregular, flexible shape. You can see the nuclei are also multi-lobed and they are also irregular in shape. So they can squeeze and squirm through these gaps. And so are the platelets, because remember platelets were just fragments of cells. So they're really small and they can also squeeze through these gaps. Okay, that's how the platelets reach the damaged tissues in case of you know, uh, blood clot formation. And the pathogen and these uh, white blood cells can also squeeze out into the tissues in case of pathogen invasion. If there is a pathogen invasion, these white blood cells will have to come out of the vessel and reach the tissue. For example, this is the pathogen. Then this WBC will have to, this white blood cell or phagocyte will have to come here to engulf it. Right? Right. So uh, this is how the plasma comes out. Now, all this fluid that left the capillaries and came out into the tissues is called the tissue fluid. That's called a tissue fluid. So basically, if I write that blood minus the red blood cells is the tissue fluid, I won't be wrong, will I be? I, I think I will be correct because everything can move out except for the red blood cells, right? And all this fluid, okay, all this fluid that moved out of the capillaries into the tissues is called tissue fluid. Okay, now the, the actual exchange of substances is between the cells and this tissue fluid. The actual exchange of substances is between these cells and the tissue fluid. And tissue fluid is that environment within which the cells survive, which, within which the cells are bathed. The cells are bathed within this tissue fluid. Okay, now after that exchange of substances has been done, it has been completed, all the oxygen has been transported, all the carbon dioxide has been extracted and all of that, then now what, where should the tissue fluid go? Can it move back in through the same holes? I don't think so, because then you know, the new, the, the, there's a constant flow of blood. There's constant flow of fresh blood and there's constant, uh, inflow of new molecules. So this used up tissue fluid does not have 
any chance of getting in through the same holes. And also remember, fresh, the blood is coming with a lot of pressure. And this tissue fluid cannot even stay within this tissue because if there is accumulation of tissue fluid, there will be swelling here. This tissue fluid has to go back. How, how can it go back? That's where the lymph vessels come in. That's where the lymph vessels come in. In, in this diagram, this is, your, this is the lymphatic vessel. This is the lymph, okay? After the exchange of substances has taken place, now this tissue fluid will return through these lymphatic vessels. Now, lymphatic vessels are also structurally very similar to blood capillaries. They are structurally very similar to blood capillaries. Same lining, lined by single uh, cells, lined by single cells, and they have small gaps between the cells, right? So they're just like capillaries. There is not much difference structurally, okay? So the tissue fluid is drained via these lymphatic vessels and these are lymphatic capillaries, by the way. These lymphatic capillaries then join up together to form bigger lymphatic vessels, just like veins, and they keep joining to form larger and larger lymphatic vessels. And eventually, they all drain into the subclavian vein okay into the subclavian vein yeah i know this is a new concept you guys have a lot of questions for me and i will answer all those questions uh let me just uh, okay I, I will take your questions in a bit let me see if i have okay uh, okay let me take your questions yeah i can see you guys have a lot of questions Okay, what are where are the okay, hepatic portal vein plasma? Okay. Why do we need hormones? Yeah, hormones are used for growth as well. Yes, for, for controlling and regulating the activities of or you know the organs, yes, for growth as well. How would plasma when to get out of capillary? Plasma, see, when the blood is coming out with pressure, a lot of pressure, see. I told you, again, I will repeat myself. Not the capillaries, Ajwa. I, I, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I will handle your questions one by one. Okay, so when the blood is entering, it is entering with, a, with you know, relatively higher pressure. Okay, because of that high pressure, the liquid part, because you see, it's easier for the liquid part. Liquid part is more flowy. It flows easily. It's more fluidy. Okay? It flows easily. So the liquid part, meaning the water part, meaning the plasma. Remember, we just discussed the components of blood and plasma is the water part, right? The water part, it is also, the blood is also like sort of a mixture with blood and with other substances in it, right? I won't say dissolved. Not all of them are dissolved, but yes, in it. So that liquid part, because of the high pressure, oozes out of these gaps between the cells of the capillaries. It's just like, think of this. If you have a pipe, okay, I, I will explain you this way. Okay, if you have a pipe, okay, and it has holes, if, if there's a pipe and it has holes, and you gush in water with a lot of pressure, won't the water trickle out? Won't the water trickle out, right? And if, you, if the water is entering with a lot of pressure, won't the water burst out? Yes, it will. So that's what happens. You know, these capillary walls have these holes, okay? And when the water is coming with pressure, the liquid part, the water part comes out and enters into the tissue. That's what I'm saying, okay? And then there is a exchange of substances. Okay, let me take the questions one by one. Uh, how does the brain get to know about a pathogen invasion? The brain gets to know later, no, but there are substances, chemicals released by the damaged tissue. The tissue that is getting damaged by the pathogen, that 
tissue releases chemical substances which attract the platelets and the other defensive uh, white blood cells and therefore uh, the body responds, right? WBCs are made in lymph. WBCs are made in lymph nodes. Yes, I haven't discussed that as yet. So the tissue fluid is platelets and WBC. Tissue fluid might have platelets and WBCs, but predominantly tissue fluid is made up of plasma and uh, all those, all that stuff which manages to leave the capillaries and gets into the surrounding tissue. Yes, and it includes, um, you know, the soluble substances can have, you know, glucose can have. <clears throat> so tissue fluid composition is variable depending upon what substances the blood is bringing in. Okay, it might have WBCs and platelets as well. <clears throat> I, uh, okay. What is lymph vessels job? Yes, we will discuss that later. So one job that I just mentioned, lymph jobs function is to drain the tissue fluid after the exchange of substances has taken place. If there were no lymphatic vessels, then the tissue fluid would accumulate within the tissues because then where will this fluid go? This, this fluid needs to drain back into the venous, into the venous blood. Okay. Uh, lymph means what? Lymph is just tissue fluid when it enters into the lymphatic vessel. Same thing. As soon as it enters into the lymphatic vessel, it's no longer tissue fluid. It's called lymph. That's just a scientific, uh, you know, uh, terminology thing. Okay. Um, okay. Do lymphatic capillaries have valves in them? Not capillaries. Capillaries do not have valves, but yes, the lymphatic vessels, the bigger lymphatic vessels, they do have valves, okay? And they, are, they function just like veins, meaning that they have valves which will prevent uh, the flow of lymph in the opposite direction, first of all. Secondly, the contraction of surrounding muscles will uh, facilitate, will assist in the flow of lymph back into the veins. Okay, so then isn't there a deficiency of tissue liquid? What? I did not understand this question, Hala. Okay, can you tell the function of tissue fluid? I just told. Because it, a, a tissue fluid's function is exchange of substances with the cells. Exchange of substances with the cells, right? Cells are with, within the tissue fluid. Cells are bathed within the, within the tissue fluid. So yeah. Blood is bringing in the substances, but the fluid in which the cells are actually in is the tissue fluid, okay? Okay, yeah, be careful with, the, with your terminologies, Ajwa and Amina and all of you. In science, you gotta be real careful of what you're saying. If you say lymphatic capillary, you are wrong, okay? You have to say lymph vessel, okay? This sort of mistake is not forgiven. In science, you will lose marks. Okay, Miss, what's the difference between hepatic portal vein and hepatic vein? You tell me, you guys tell me. So what is the meaning of lymph like hepatic mean liver? You don't have, you don't have, uh, like all the medical terminologies are not related to, uh, you know, their regions or sites. Lymph is just uh, tissue fluid which has entered into the lymphatic vessel. That's that. Okay. What do you mean by D slash T? Well, that's my shorthand writing for my notes. That, that means due to. Uh, hepatic joins heart and liver. Do you have the number of signs? What? If the tissue fluid is stuck, you get the disease. If the tissue fluid is stuck, you get the disease. If the tissue fluid does is not drained and it remains there in the tissues, that will lead to, yes, that will lead to swelling. Yes, that's lymphedema. Good job, Ibrahim. What is the size of a lymphatic vessel? Almost the same as veins. Yeah. Yes, Atika, due to. Why, Kuzema? Why are you interested in the phone number? 
why why are you so much interested please do not ask unnecessary uh, questions okay the hepatic vein collects deoxygenated uh, blood from the liver good job saad aslam i appreciate your a contribution your positive contribution the hepatic vein collects deoxygenated blood from the liver good job now what about hepatic portal vein can you please uh, also answer that so yes hepatic vein is taking deoxygenated blood from the liver to the general circulation right into the let's say infer inferior vena cava and what about the hepatic portal vein p o r t a l what is the job of hepatic portal vein uh transports digested food from the intestine to the liver yes good job saad aslam good job samia good job okay i appreciate constructive positive contribution in the discussion okay i do not want any anything else at all if you have a genuine question please ask a genuine question i don't know what am i doing i'm just answering questions okay uh, okay no i need to move on okay now okay 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 i think i discussed all of that okay what is that process called uh, in which uh, the body tries to keep in which the body tries to keep the environment of the cells constant what is that process called good job ajwa good job good job you know there are a few students who are participating in a very positive way and i will take their names ajwa um and saad aslam and samia and uh wells yes okay these are the ones i i like a lot their participation is really beneficial okay homeostasis many organs uh, okay homeostasis is the process through which yes um and a good job homeostasis samia hiba good job homeostasis yes the, the the process in which the body tries to keep the environment of the cells constant is called homeostasis now which organs participate in this homeostasis which organs participate okay good job brain good job kidneys good job number one organ number one organ yes is skin lungs yes now can i ask you guys to explain me i uh, you know like i unmute you and you explain me how each of these organs contribute towards homeostasis spinal cord uh i don't think so yeah indirectly maybe yeah okay pancreas good job yusra that's a good one liver liver is number one again ajwa <laughs> good job ajwa i think you're doing a lot of study and i appreciate that i like it yes it's the liver liver yes all these other organs that you guys have mentioned yes they also participate in homeostasis but liver is number one yeah basically you know if you look at it that way all the organs participate all the organs sayed nabil what do you mean by nucleus nucleus is not an organ good job khuzaima the kidneys remove waste products from metabolism such as urea uric acid and creatinine good job by producing and secreting urine the kidneys help maintain homeostasis by regulating uh, did you uh, copy paste from google <laughs> okay uh yes look at that i'm not impressed i'm not impressed sorry sorry did we study homeostasis no not as a chapter but yes here in this book they are talking about homeostasis a little bit so i thought why not to discuss with you yes liver by um a processing all these uh, you know substances coming from the intestine uh is 
participating in homeostasis. It is the most major organ which ensures that the environment in which the cells live is constant. Now, let's talk about the lymphatic system a little more. I am, yes, pancreas in, uh, secrete insulin and therefore they regulate the, uh, the pancreas regulates the level of blood glucose. Yes, Samia, good job. Brain detects changes in body and responds co correspondingly. Good job. Yes, Ajwa, liver and pancreas keep our blood sugar level constant. Yes. Skin produce sweat. Yes. And therefore, it helps in maintaining constant temperature. Right. Small intestines? No. I, I, not that I can think of. No. It, it, small intestines just digest and absorb. Tears? No. No. Tears' job is to clean our eyes. Okay, to get rid of the pathogens from our eyes. Okay, that's the job of, and eyes are very delicate. Their cleanliness is of high importance. No, stomach also digests. Okay, let's move on. Now, I have to share my screen. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, I wanted you to see this. Uh, these are fat molecules. Okay, they are made up of like they're broken down into two sorts of molecules fatty acid molecules and glycerol molecules okay these fatty acid and glycerol they are polar and soluble and they are also smaller than the fat molecules therefore they easily dissolve but still still they cannot directly be absorbed into the capillaries therefore they have to enter into the lymphatic capillaries of the intestines, which are called lacteals. And from there, they indirectly enter the general circulation, okay? This you had done in the chapter of digestion. This is urea. Yeah, this is the lymphatic system, the whole lymphatic system. I wanted you to have a look at it. You can see these nodules sort of structures, these circular round nodes, these are the lymph nodes. These are those sites where WBCs, meaning white blood cells, are synthesized. So you will see a lot of white blood cells within these lymph nodes. And we have these groups of lymph nodes in different parts of the body, usually in the groin region between the legs and the trunk, and arm region, which is in medical terms called axillary region. Then you have in the thoracic region, you have in the neck region, okay? And all these are eventually draining into the subclavian vein. Can you see the blue colored subclavian vein? These subclavian, these, these are the veins which are draining the arms. Draining the arms, they're like, they're collecting deoxygenated blood from the arms and then eventually draining into the vena cava. A vena cava and then into the which which chamber of the heart uh, yeah right atrium yes so subclavian vein so both into the left and the right subclavian vein okay that is the eventual destination of all the lymphatic capillaries all the lymph and all the lymphatic capillaries will eventually drain into the subclavian vein okay okay Okay, another very important thing I wanted to tell you was what is the difference between the general circulation and the lymphatic circulation? Is there any difference? Is there any difference between the lymphatic circulation and the general circulation? Here, I want you, no, there, there are two differences. One is that the lymph circulation, yes. One is that the lymph circulation is a slower than blood than the blood flow. Lymph flow is a slower than blood flow. That is one, okay? And yes, it has to do with the fact that lymphs, lymphatic vessels are not in direct connection with the heart. So there is nothing to pump. There's nothing to give pressure to the lymph. Therefore, the lymph flow is a slower than the blood. That makes sense. Another thing is that, can you see that these lymphatics are just blindly starting from the tissues? They're just blindly starting from the tissues 
into the subclavian vein, into the into the venous system, right? So this is not a closed loop. The loop is not a clo is not closed. There is no connection between the origin and the end. So that's another difference. Lymphatic circulation is not a closed loop. Okay, closed loop meaning closed loop meaning this. This is a closed loop. Okay, so though our blood circulation is in the form of closed loop, it originates from the heart and ends into the heart. Okay, both the systemic and the pulmonary circulations, but lymphatic circulation is not a closed loop. Okay, okay. Uh, now let's see if we have any questions at the end of the book related to what we discussed. Okay, let's answer these questions. Difference between blood and lymph. This we have already discussed, difference between hepatic vein and hepatic portal vein. Difference between blood and lymph. So you got to talk about the difference in their composition first. Yes, and then you can talk about other points as well, but first composition. First composition. Good job, Sada Slum. Good job. Yes. Lymph has no or red blood cells. Any other? Uh, but does not contain, yeah. Okay, another thing. Lymph also does not contain platelets. Okay, I, I, I forgot that. Lymph has a composition similar to plasma but does not contain red blood cells or platelets. It does contain white blood cells, right? There are no platelets. I don't know the reason why. I will look into it. Yes, good job. Yes, Salaslam, that's a good uh, difference that blood is red in color and lymph is colorless. Good job. And Ibrahim, what does polar mean? Uh, what does polar mean? Who, who wants to answer this question? Yes, and then you can say that blood flow is rapid and lymph is slow. Yes. Ibrahim asked us, lymph has WBCs more in number. Uh, well, yeah, you can say that maybe, uh, but I, I'm not sure about that because WBC, the red blood cell also has WBC. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Okay, who wants to answer Ibrahim's question? What does polar mean? Yesterday when I was explaining you polar molecules, you guys were asking me, where do we use these polar molecules? Where do we use them? Can you see you are using them everywhere? Everywhere, literally. Polar is a thing which can dissolve in water. In solution. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Identify the components of blood that have each of the following functions, transporting carbon dioxide. Okay, tell me, transporting carbon dioxide. Which component of blood does that? Component of blood, identify the components of blood, transporting carbon dioxide. Plasma, yes, a small amount red blood cell, but, but predominantly plasma, yes. Plasma, large amounts in plasma in the form of, good job, Amina, bicarbonate ion, good job. Destroying bacteria, which component of blood does that? Yes, WBCs, yes. Transporting urea, yes, plasma, good job. Transporting oxygen. Red blood cells, yes. Clotting, platelets, good job. Transporting glucose. Transporting glucose, no, not platelets, not RBCs. Plasma, yes, glucose dissolves in the water, right? So plasma, right? Okay, I think we did this, arteries, veins, and capillaries when we were doing blood vessels. Let's move on to this question. The diagram shows two cells found in human blood. The actual diameter of a red blood cell is this, this. In diameter, calculate the magnification of the diagram. Show your working. How do you calculate magnification? 
how do you calculate magnification any ideas okay okay yeah uh yes yes you know the size on the diagram it can be anything it can be diameter or whatever length height whatever they have given in the diagram size on the diagram divided by the actual size will give you magnification now do you rectify this do you rectify this don't rectify it i will tell you see magnification is what magnification is how many times magnification is what understand what magnification is actual size got multiplied by how many times to give you the size on the diagram because remember the size on diagram is the magnified right it is the enlarged size so that you can easily see it and understand it right so this is the enlarged final form how many times did you multiply the actual size that is magnification right this is magnification how how many times did you multiply the actual size to get the size on the diagram so you rearrange this you rearrange this uh equate uh, this formula this equation and this is what you get size on the diagram whatever the enlarged size they could you know name it anyway and divided by the actual size you will get the magnification right okay so put in uh, so so measure with the help of a ruler measure it okay put in size on the diagram put in that diameter whatever you get in millimeters and then divide that by this actual size given in the question and what you get will be your magnification describe three differences between the structure of a red blood cell and a white blood cell yes lubna yes they are biconcave white blood cells are irregular and yes red blood cells have nuclei uh, they do not have nucleus and white white blood cells have multi lobed nuclei what else they have hemoglobin right and white blood cells are colorless they do not have any hemoglobin right white blood cells might have other proteins okay which are required for the synthesis of antibodies they might have proteins to uh, form that vacuole and you know those enzymes to kill those to kill those pathogens so they might have a lot of proteins in them state the function of a red blood cell this we know transport of oxygen ibrahim uh, please do not repeat i have already explained polar molecules yesterday in great detail but you guys were constantly asking me which page of the book is it where is it and then you know yeah i i tried to explain yeah, yesterday's class i tried my best to explain you guys okay in short polar molecules are those molecules in which the charge is separated due to one atom being more electronegative than the other and therefore that atom is pulling on the electrons more and therefore there is a separation of charge and that separation of charge makes that molecule more soluble in water why because water is also polar and remember polar solvent will dissolve polar solutes because like like molecules become friends you know you are friends with people who are like you so same is the case with these mo molecules polar dissolve in polar non polar dissolve in non polar non polar will never dissolve in polar therefore the oil will never dissolve in water it will always float on its surface yes okay state the function okay explain how the structure of a red blood cell helps it to carry out this function okay let me see you guys are mashallah participating so well let me see uh, by concave disc expand surface area of the cell membrane for oxygen to diffuse across so more oxygen can be carried in the red blood cell yes yes lubna good job but just a little uh, change by concave shape 
will uh, give it a greater surface area to volume ratio, right? It would give it a greater surface area to volume ratio and therefore diffusion of oxygen will be more efficient, right? And lack of nucleus gives more space for hemoglobin. So more hemoglobin molecules can be accommodated within the red blood cell, which can then carry oxygen, right? Right, okay. Okay, let's move on because we are out of time. Did we do this question? No, okay. Okay, real quick. The diagram shows how the volume of the left ventricle changes over a time period of 1.3 seconds. How many complete heartbeats are shown in the diagram? Now, let me cap this, cap this. Okay, now, this is the volume of left ventricle on the y-axis, and this is time, right? So each time the volume of ventricle is decreasing, question number two, okay. So each time the volume of ventricle is decreasing, do not jump onto the answer, okay? If you are answering, I will ask you to explain. I will ask you to, uh, to explain, okay? So pay attention to the explanation. Okay, knowing the answer is not a great deal. I'm not impressed by the, by the correct answer. I am impressed by the reason. If you know the reason behind the correct answer, then I know that you know it. So each time the volume of ventricle is decreasing, meaning this is what? Ventricular contraction, because the volume went down. The volume went down. So these are two ventricular contractions, because the volume of ventricle went down. So I can see two beats. These are, this is one contraction, this is another contraction. So these are two beats. Okay, use your answer to B1 to calculate the heart rate. Show you're working. Yes, there are two ventricular contractions, meaning there are two beats, yes. So now we have to see from where, where is one beat ending and from which point is the other beat starting. So you gotta see a repeating pattern here. So ventricular contracted and then ventricle expanded, okay? And then again, this is filling of the ventricle, further expansion and then contraction. So I can see that there is a repeating pattern here. Okay, can you see? So I think one heartbeat, this is, uh, this is where the first heartbeat is ending and this is where the second heartbeat is starting, right? So to calculate the heart rate. So with this, if I, I can use that, you know, uh, 0.75 seconds, let me use this, hold this, hold this camera for me. So if I have in 0.75 seconds, I have one heartbeat, in one second I would have how much? So one, multiplied by 1.75. So one divided by 0 0.75 is what? What is it? What's the answer at the back? Or the answer is given? Uh, this is question 6B. Show or use your answer to be one explanation of measuring time between two equivalent points. Okay. Yeah, so this is how you calculate the heartbeat. Okay, describe what is happening between points A and B on the graph. A and B, what's happening? Yes, ventricular contraction. Good job, ventricular systole, because you can see the volume decreasing. Right. Okay. Yes, thank you, science. Okay. <laughs> Describe how the valves between the atria and ventricles help to ensure a one-way flow of blood through the heart. Okay. Make, uh, describe how the valves between the atria and the ventricles help to ensure a one-way flow of blood through the heart. We have discussed this, that when the ventricles contract, the pressure within the ventricles increase. And so, yeah, if, if this is, for example, and you know, just a rough diagram. So when this contracts, the volume decreases, and and so the pressure increases. This high pressure would 
force the blood to move back into the atria so these valves close so that the blood flows only into the aorta right so that's all you need to write here yes 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 good job make a copy of the graph shown above on your graph sketch a line to show the volume of the right ventricle during this time period now what difference would you see between left ventricle and right ventricle it will be opposite see ventricles contract together L right and left both of them contract almost together simultaneously right so you cannot have opposite okay both the left and the right ventricles will contract together but the difference left ventricle will have less volume hala yes a smaller bump why you guys give me incomplete answers amna you will not just give me the correct answer you will also give me explanation why less pressure again incomplete answer why less pressure do i do i answer your questions this way if i answer your questions this way will you understand mm -hmm. you have to answer in such a way that the other person is completely convinced and he understands your point even though he might not know anything that's how i want you to answer smaller bump due to less contraction of the right ventricle why less contraction of the right ventricle because it has thin walls okay yes yeah okay it has thin wall thin walls and because it is only pumping to the lungs yeah and that's why it has thinner wall and therefore its contraction is not as strong as that of the left ventricle so yeah you will have the same graph yes good job myra good job yes yes i want you to say that i want you to give me that reasoning right so now you know the reasoning yes because the right ventricle fills only the lungs right so you will have the same graph but a little lower than the actual graph because the pressures will be pressure values will be little lower okay okay i know i am going it's 917 i am so sorry this is the last question okay heart surgeons may stop the heart beating during operations while this happens blood is pumped through a heart lung machine that oxygenates the blood the diagram below shows a heart lung machine in use and then they are asking you to label all these parts okay but instead of the lungs the blood is going through this uh, reservoir of deoxygenated blood removed from the body body and then this is the oxygenator acting as the lungs uh, putting an in oxygen into the lungs and then the oxygen blood is getting returned to the body yes yes atika okay name the structures labeled a to d yes i know i know yusra you are tired but i don't want to leave this one question for the next class just just bear with me this a is what this is left ventricle so this must be left atrium good job b easy left is mitral valve or this is on the left side right so left side mltr my mnemonic so mitral valve or the bicuspid valve right and then c is the semi lunar valve c is the aortic valve right this is aorta by the way this is aorta so f is aorta you know that arch thing the arch thing coming out of the heart is always aorta remember d if this is left ventricle this must be right ventricle yes and then e you can see it is coming vertically downwards entering into the right atrium this must be superior vena cava good job and this is the inferior vena cava because it is bringing blood from the lower side of the body right good job so we have done this okay name the blood vessels e and f we have done it okay the heart lung machine is used so that surgeons can operate on the arteries supplying heart muscle these arteries may be diseased name these arteries and explain how they become diseased these arteries are coronary arteries good job hiba and their disease is due to the plaque formation atheroma due to high levels of lipid in the blood which lipid 
the low density lipoproteins, right? Low density lipoproteins because they have greater lipid content and so they get uh, deposited. And then also blood clot, yes, coronary heart disease. So you can tell all that story, okay? You know what, in an empty room, or even if others don't mind, sit down, tell all these stories. Tell the story of coronary heart disease, what happens, okay? Tell all these stories in, in, in your room. Suggest why a patient is put on a heart-lung machine during such an operation. To keep the, yes, good job. To keep the blood getting oxygenated while he is off his lungs, off his own lungs. Otherwise, the cells may get deprived of the oxygen, right? Yes. Humans have a blood circulation, a double circulation system. There is a low, there is a low pressure circulation and a high pressure circulation. Explain how the structure of the heart enables it to pump blood into two circulations at different pressures. Again, incomplete answer, Amna, again. Now septum, but uh, the right ventricle has thin walls, the left ventricle has thick wall, and therefore the left ventricle uh, you know, has a greater uh, strength to uh, pump the blood through the whole body whereas the right ventricle has thin walls and so it manages to have lower pressures enough to uh, pump the blood through the lungs, right? Okay, and this is the answer, okay? Has a septum dividing the two sides of the heart, oxygenated blood on the left and deoxygenated on the right, both sides contract at the same time, okay? Remember this, both sides contract at the same time. More muscle on the left side, so more pressure produced on the left side, high pressure to most of the body and low pressure to lungs. With that, alhamdulillah, we have come to the end of this chapter. We have done transport in animals. Okay, now tell me, uh, uh, what is the next chapter according to the uh, scheme of studies? Can you guys tell me? Do we have that respiratory system? Thanks to science for what? Can you repeat 7D, please? Jazakallah, you explain the chapter. Okay, Jazakallah, Barakallah Fee. Uh, you, you guys don't have the CD of this book? All these answers are in the CD. I hope you guys understood. It's not about completing the chapter. I hope you guys understood. I know you have a lot of questions. No, 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 no. Lazy, laziness doesn't work with me. Just because you're lazy, I'm not gonna send you. <laughs> I don't like lazy people. I will not send just because you're lazy. Okay, uh, 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 just tell me. Okay, Atika, you can send in the group. Okay, uh, uh, tell me something. Um, uh, what is the next chapter according to SOS? Okay, you guys can post in the group and let me know what is the next chapter in biology. Okay, uh, otherwise. Then tomorrow we will do a conduction, convection, and radiation of physics, inshallah. And with that, we will be done with physics as well. Okay? Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I will not unmute because I know what you guys do. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah